Hello. It looks like the stream has started, all right. So this is going to be um, part of the Astro Theology Discussion Series. And right now I'm still uh, talking about the book, The Celestial Code of Scripture by John McHugh. In a previous stream and video, um, I discussed chapters introduction through six, which talked about the method and uh, the method and the general premise of the work. So now we're up to chapter seven. And there I'll just I'm just turning to the beginning of that chapter. Chapter seven is on the Astral Garden of Eden. And this will be interpreting how the Lumashi constellation writing, which the author uh, talks about, tells uh, or can be built up with the, the various uh, puns and homophones and homonyms and such to to tell the story of the Garden of Eden as as read in the Hebrew Bible, uh, what the Christians call the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. So um, to tell this story, I prepared some of these. Uh, I made some new flashcards for the Sumerian cuneiform logograms, just, just the ones that would be in this chapter. And I, I'm also uh, going to reference some of my, my custom flashcards for constellations. I also may refer to, I'm reaching for it, sorry. I also may refer to this guide to the stars. I've shown this um, in the previous, in the previous stream, but just to show it again, this particular, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not in frame. This particular one is published by Ken Press, KenPress.com. Uh, I think I got mine on Amazon. And there may be some other information I reference, and I'll, I'll mention that later. So I'll just, I'm going to move some of these over a little bit. Excuse me. So in the beginning of Chapter 7... The author, John McHugh, is talking about just the history of how people interpreted Genesis and particularly the, the story that takes place in the Garden of Eden and how at some points in time people, or not only time, because there's still some people that have this, this interpretation, but had a, a more literal interpretation of this being history. And then at some... Um, information about the past was discovered and the age of the earth and different um, ancient texts were discovered. You know, some people start to not see it as so much historical, but more as a mythic story. Can, maybe, you know, could it be allegory or um, theology? So the author is... Um, but anyway, but still there's this story, and I know that there are other interpretations of this where people say, like, I just saw a video from uh, the Crecken, Creckenford YouTube channel. That's I think that's spelled C-R-E-C-G-A-N-F-O-R-D, Creckenford. Um yeah, his YouTube channel just actually had a video about the influence of other myths and how they could have uh, come together to to give us elements of the Genesis story. But here in, in this work, um, Jean McHugh is proposing that almost, I don't want to say entirely because I don't want to put words in his mouth, but a lot, I would say, or a significant portion of the Genesis story comes just from 
this what he calls the I don't know if this is his term or it, this is a term from Sumerian studies I actually don't know that but it's called Lumashi and he translates or or gives that as constellation writing so I'm just going to show a picture from uh, the book we're ta I'm talking about and this is illustrated by Elizabeth Hardy and I don't know if this, I, I know this is not super in focus, but. So the chapter starts out with this image, which shows a figure of, it looks like a man in a Sumerian type uh, costume. And it's titled Hired Worker. And then next to that is Plow. There's an image of some kind of plow. Then there's this square, or not, I square-ish shape labeled field and then sort of below to the right is this figure of Ea who is a deity um a water deity he has these shoulder rivers as uh I don't know if Brothers of the Serpent first started that but I I know they use it the the shoulder rivers that come out of him but um that is an interesting that is one depiction of this uh, this deity. Um, and I believe there's others where it's just a seated figure without the, the shoulder rivers. And I think some of that does appear in another chapter. But anyway, so this is the setup. So you may or may not already recognize this from um, what was mentioned in the previous stream, but the hired worker is our constellation Aries. The plow is our triangle or triangle or triangulum. The field is the, the great square of Pegasus. And they're saying here that Aea is the Aquarius constellation. And I believe that's something that it, it's not exclusive to this author. I believe that identification is one of the more confirmed ones that you can find in other sources. But if you know the skies, you'll notice kind of the illustration in the book is only showing the relevant constellations at this point. Pisces would be right here where there's a blank space. Pisces is here. Um, Andromeda flows out of... Um, the Pegasus square. So the distance here is, I don't think is to scale because also Perseus fits in here somewhere. And then the uh, legs and head of Pegasus, the horse head and the horse forelegs would be here in this region. So I'm just going to, see if I can show that on this other map. Let me turn to it. Right, okay. Let's see if I'm not getting too much reflection. Okay, so on this particular map, the, the guide to the stars one, Aries is this whole portion here where they're saying Ao can be seen. Then the the Pegasus square is, you know, like above, like a little slightly diagonally above or toward the north it would be. Then we have Pisces taking up that that what was what was like white space on in the book. And the head and legs of Pegasus are on the other side of that. Then moving over a little, Andromeda comes out of the star Alpharaz. Is this? Um, it is both the navel of the horse and the head of the woman. So Andromeda actually is quite here. And then Triangulum is kind of where Andromeda is, like like south of uh, where Andromeda's feet would be. And then Aries is. I guess would be south of that. And Perseus is just the other side. So Perseus can, we can kind of say Perseus is like the other side of what's going on in this uh, image. But 
I later in the chapter, Pisces will be relevant. It's just I believe the author has chosen not to introduce that aspect until um, other parts are established. So getting to how this is set up in um I'm reaching here, sorry. Um getting to how this is set up in the chapter, Aries is probably gonna be here. And I had a little piece of paper here that I'm not seeing right now. Did it fall out? Uh oh. It was it was tucked in one of these pages. Um, I kind of I kind of need that. Oh, I found it. I think it was in a later page somehow. Okay. Yeah, I want to look at this. Okay, so. Uh, or let me just flip back to this and show you again real quick. If you notice in their illustration, the god, Ea, is kind of facing north towards the field. And we just also looked at the star map. I, If the god is facing the field, I'm not sure. And let me just say, okay, so I want to present my take on this. And as well as present, present, uh, you know, the book, what, uh, my interpretation of the book, but also what is the book actually, what's the content of the book? What is the author actually saying? So for the author's point, it's not important which way the actual constellations face or how the line art looks, because the puns that we'll talk about are the important thing. But I think generally in astrotheology, what you see in the sky must be important if that's where this Lumashi writing is, if they're observing the actual stars. So I was considering that maybe, you know, the shoulder rivers, if we think that these two stars here are the shoulders and this is the pointy hat and this this is the asterism or this portion here where there's like a triangle of three stars with the one in the center i don't know if you can see that that's an asterism within aquarius called the tents the tents um and also this star citula <clears throat> It's, excuse me, <clears throat> I apologize. <clears throat> okay, so that star citula, it means like the, the, the bucket. So let me, okay, let me just show you. So if we imagine this, I'm going to kind of just like draw it in a marker, but there's a figure, they have kind of like a, a chest area. They have a leg, here's like the hip. One leg's coming out this way. Another leg's coming out this way. They're reaching this way. There's a fish. Coming out of their shoulder. There's kind of a a bucket shape over here. You can also imagine that their arm is holding that bucket. The head would be here. And then there's kind of like a pointy hat. And I'm going to add that a little bit over this way is something. And a little bit down or actually, I guess, let's draw in some of these particular stars. Uh, 
Well done. Yeah, this one. And I think that's the most we need for right now. Okay. So these are the stars mostly from Aquarius, but I'll I'll point out where there's exceptions. So let me go to my flashcard version because that's like a little easier to see. Okay, so these two stars, which here are the shoulders, is Sadal Melik. Melik. Me, sorry, I'm saying this wrong. Melik. So a lot of these star names are not true Arabic. I mean, some star names aren't Arabic at all, but there's a lot of star names that are the official international star names today that come from Arabic, but they're not accurate Arabic words. They're, they're like a proper name that's like based on or like a degraded or transliterated form of Arabic. But we sometimes know the general meaning of what it did mean in the past in other languages. And um, there's a book that I got some of this information from that I don't have here to show you. I have it digitally. I will try and find that, but I think it's called Star Names and Their Lore, but I'll have to check on that. Okay, so, but that means, like, this star is the lucky one of the king. So, yeah, that makes sense if maybe someone's imagining, you know, an important figure. This star is a Sad al Sud, the luckiest or luckiest of the lucky. Um... Is it this one? One of, I think it's this one here. Is Sadash Sadakpia? Lucky star of the tens, because remember this is a fish here. But it's also contains what's called the tent asterism, where these this group of stars was, was imagined as tents. Um there's a star that's like down. Yeah, it's like somewhere down here on um, on where we have to now the bucket, and that is called uh, like Shiat or Scott. There's different pronunciations given in the in the books. I think it's Scott today, but some of the meanings are it could be a wish or. A shin, like the bone, like the shin of the bone behind your shin or the shin bone. I guess just the front of the leg. So it makes me wonder if in some interpretations this is a leg and it's not further over here. Or is it wish in some other, you know, symbolic sense of, uh, you know, wishing on stars or wishing well or something like that. Then there's a star here. I think it's like oh, actually there's like a pair of stars here at the, that forms like what we can imagine to be the hand, and it's called Good Fortune of the Swallower. Which sounds like a weird, a weird name for a star. But if you think that this is the person bearing water, then I that kind of makes sense. This star Ansha is it means the hip. And I believe I also I already mentioned that Situla has a meaning of the bucket. So here, this star that's the head is not actually part of Aquarius. It's um it's from Pegasus. So then let's let's go and draw in the Pegasus portion. I'm just trying to put my uh, Aquarius card away and look for my Pegasus card. Okay. So let's see. What color can we make Pegasus? Let's just make Pegasus green. So this star here would also be part of Pegasus. And uh, I believe that is just the star's name is Anif. But I believe it's meant to mean the nose. 
And then it's kind of like, I guess kind of like over here. I'm going to say like roughly over here is Markab. Shiat. Alfaraz. And Alganib. And this is the the great square of Pegasus. And then we can kind of just in a lighter green show that the uh, there's some stars over here that make the horse head. I'm sorry, the horse head and there's like some lit. This is roughly I, um, or I can show you the card. And let's see what color would Andromeda like to be. Pink. Let's put Pegasus back. They're alphabetical right now, so I mean. Let's put it in here. And then this star is also part of Andromeda. And Andromeda is kind of like... So there's this is the head, and then there's like... Like a shoulders. There's kind of like an arm reaching down here. An arm reaching up here. There's like chains. Uh, it goes to her waist, maybe like here. One leg goes here. One leg goes like here. I think there's like two more. We'll kind of like just make a neck there. That's Andromeda. Okay, what else do we need? Um, we need, I'm gonna draw Pisces in here. Oh, we need Aries in the triangle, right? Okay. Okay, here we go. So then Aries in the triangle is like right over here. I, well, see, we're getting a little bit out of scale. But this is just for like demonstration purposes because it's kind of more over this way, I guess. So actually, let's use not such orange. It's n I'm not trying to be like overly symbolic about <laughs> the um, the colors, but so the triangle is. Well, it's actually more here over this way somewhat, but <sighs> I messed that up. Sorry. It's a triangle. And then further south, there's like, or the big star is like here. Okay, then it goes, and it goes up, and there is other stars, but it's mostly like, like some kind of, that's the main one that we see. And what else did I say? Oh, Pisces. And then Pisces is where the circlet of Pisces is between these two. And the, the circuit, the, I'm sorry, the circlet is an asterism within Pisces. And when it's seen as a fish, there's an additional star over here. And then the other, because there's two fish in Pisces, is uh, 
closer to, I think, oh, yeah, to the, the waist of Andromeda. It's pretty close to there. So, wait, am I looking at the right thing? Oh, yeah, so here. So it's then the joining knot is further below here, like maybe around here. And then these like threads go here and here. Okay. So this might look like a crazy mess, but here's something to remember over here. Do we have a different color I haven't used? Just, oh, sorry, I just knocked the camera. Let's just use purple. Okay. Because this star is... I'm just looking at the angle so I can draw this in. I think it goes... Huh, I'm trying to see if I can see this. I think it goes this way. I'm sorry, it actually it's more like there's like another star here. And then not quite reaching here, but there's a and then more like out this way. Okay, so the, like I'm saying, you know, this is not terribly to scale, right? But I think you can kind of see that we have the same type of figures, right? So their illustration, okay, there's the god, Ea, there's this field, there's a figure and a plow, okay? So uh, let's just write this. Okay, so this is what they're saying, where the plow would be. There's the person figure. It's mostly just a line. When when you look at the bright stars, it's not, um, you know, it's super detailed. You can draw in the legs of the of the ram, but there's mostly dim stars there. Andromeda wasn't on their illustration, but that's where it is in relation. Pisces wasn't in that part of the chapter, but it's here. There's also this other part of Pegasus that kind of goes, you know, and then this is Aquila the Eagle. Well, I don't know if you've seen it. I don't know if I can find it quickly on my phone or something to show you. Um, let me see if I can quickly find it. I don't have something in a book that I can show you. Images of... A, uh... Oh, not EA. It's showing me the. Yeah, let's try Enki. A and Enki is the same. Okay, here's one. I'll show it to you in a second. I'm just like. Okay. This is from one of those like uh, old cylinder seal uh, artifacts. Okay, I don't know if you can see. It's like a picture of my screen, but okay. It's like the one leg is raised up further and these are mountains. So it's on a mountain. 
Um, the other foot is down here. There's an animal here. There's the shoulder rivers. The pointy hat. The arm kind of bent and reaching out. And there's a bird. Like, a, it could be an eagle or a bird of prey. But see how this is flipped. It's like the eagle's on this side of the figure instead of over here. But considering that this is a cylinder seal, it, it's an, you impress them into clay. So both the, the printed on clay version and the, and the uh, or not both. I mean, they're diff they would be opposite. It would be mirrored. You understand? So like the, the cylinder seal itself would have one direction. And then when you impress it into the clay, it would be like mirrored from the original so it's kind of like well which are you going from are you going from the carved um seal or, or the impression so it's kind of like upper grabs but i'm trying to zoom in like what animal does that look like down there does it look like it could be a goat but there is some kind of animal there and in the sky, Capricorn is right below Aquarius. Do I have any other colors that I haven't used yet? Um, I used purple, black. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Fail. Uh, I'm looking around if I dropped any. Um, let's, I don't know if this color will show up. It's kind of light. Uh, let's just use brown again. Or brown. Okay, so Capricorn. C. So, d down from here, um, Okay. So, given that picture from, and I think you can see it, it's still in frame, right? Okay. Sorry. Um, given the picture that we just looked like, uh, I think that was just on Wikipedia, of Aya slash Enki, it makes sense astrotheologically in general that the constellation would be imagined like this the pointy hat is part of pegasus and the little horse aquarius is most of the body oh actually i drew something in the wrong place this star and the star are the same one let me just i have done something like not quite in scale the star and the star are like the same star. This should be shifted down a little bit. That's my bad. But, uh, so anyway. Um, okay, so. Talking about the myth. John McHugh in uh, the Celestial Code of Scripture. Is only right now using this, this, and these figures over here. And not really addressing the, 
that these other figures are intertwined with them. That's okay. But I'm just, I want to point out that that's the case, that it's focusing on certain, on certain figures. But that is only one part of it because the premise of, um, the premise of this book that McHugh has written is that, well, the actual, I'll just, here, let me move this over here. The actual cuneiform logograms are such an important part of the, pre of the premise. Excuse me. Because without the different readings and puns, you don't get the... What the premise is saying is that because of these various logograms and puns that were known to Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, and then the other foreigners that came to live among them and learned their languages, including uh, Hebrew-speaking peoples and the Greek-speaking peoples and their cultures, that if you don't have that interaction and understanding of the languages then this maybe is not the best interpretation. But that's what, you know, that's what I'm discussing. Is this one of the better interpretations of astrotheology? Is this a way that the stars influence people's beliefs in the divine because they saw things in the sky, which they believed was from the gods, because we talked about in the other stream that in their like mental map or their worldview that things in the sky were the heavens. It was the realm of the gods. So the first thing, uh, let me find the right one. Is this one is um, in this chapter is that the, the in uh, Sumer and Akkad and Babylon, which had pretty much shared a, uh, constellation ideas this constellation the name of it in their language what are it translates as the field but their reading of it was this uh or i mean this logogram was what it was used for this you would read this their word for field like i'm i can't actually speak sumerian but this logogram when they saw in the name of the logogram, I understand if I'm, you know, I just drew these from pictures in the chapter. So there could be my mistakes, but my understanding is that if they read this, they would be speaking aloud. Um, I wonder, does it say how they, they pronounced it? Not sure if it's saying that. Okay, so oh, Iku. Okay, I think if I'm understanding. Okay, yes. Gan is the name of the symbol, and a reading for it was Iku. So I don't know if I should put that on here. Iku. I'll put that in pencil because, you know, whatever. So then they're saying, we find the right one. It's the one that says Kiri. Oh, here. Yeah. If you write the GAN logogram, but you incline it, that's indicating the inclined version. See, it still has like the, the three and the one and the two longers, but now they're inclined. Then this is Kiri. But Kiri means garden. So I guess then this is both a field and a garden in, in English. That's the translation. So then they're introducing the concept that if 
the shape of the star of the constellation of stars looks like one of the logograms. And I'm trying to find the right one here. See how it it's a, like a square shape, the actual logogram. They're saying, or I mean, not, I'm sorry. The author is saying, if this constellation of the field, which through the ponds also can be read as garden, has this shape, then the people that knew this Lumashi writing would say, oh, it's the secretly, the esoteric reading is that it's this sign gob. Um, so then does it say what some readings for the gob is? I think it does. Yeah, so they're saying like that it has this meaning of um, the country, the plains, uh, the steppe land. And then one of the logograms that also had that step land meaning was Eden. But I don't see in this chapter where the logogram Eden is written. So I don't know what that one looks like. But it is saying that there's a connection there. That you get the name Eden from Lagab. Although I don't believe it's direct from what I have read. So then they go, so Lagab is also here with like, you know, these Gan and Gan, you know, Iku and Kiri, these Gan and Lagab, these three are all talking about this square here. So then it goes to the name for their version of Aries, which was the hired worker, was Luhunga. Lu Luhun, I think it's like a hard H. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that well. Luhunga. And uh, where are they? Oh, sorry. So this is Ga. I believe it you have Lu. Okay, here, let's see. Okay, so this figure is named Luhunga, right? But Lu, they're saying a reading for that is man, or it could be a designator for man or, or male or, or people. So I'm just going to, I'm going to write man as one of the readings or no, that's the translation. So we'll just say man is one of the, the translated words, not, um, I was looking if it tells me the reading and not the logogram or Lou is the reading. I'm okay. Me not knowing Sumerian, it is a little confusing. So I don't know. Is Lou the reading or is Lou the name of the, of the logogram? Yeah. I, I might have some of these wrong. Okay, so then how do we get to having the the other figure here? This part was a little bit there's I'm just going to kind of like skip over because this part was a little bit it's not something that I can really like show you. It's kind of, it goes from like a couple different terms like uh, Dingir, I think that just means like the gods, but then it's saying that through the various puns and such, you get to other words like Edim or May, and then the author is translating that into a phrase 
he will be, and then saying that translates to the name Yahweh. So I don't know if there's a way I can just show you that because it's the, and I think I talked about this in the in the in the previous stream. If you're a person who does not yourself know the Akkadian and Sumerian, at some point you're kind of just trusting that these puns and like esoteric readings, you know, are what they are. So let's just say anyway, this is the God, whoever is in charge of the garden. So let's just move our Uhunga over here for a minute. And then, um, and then through other ponds, we're getting the plow. This is the plow. And I'm going to write hired worker here. And then they're saying this is a. Uh, a, uh, who would also be known at later, later cultures as Enki. And they're saying that also stands in for, um, you know, the, the Hebrew deity Yahweh, if that's how it's pronounced. Um, okay, and they're saying that the plow has one of these puns or esoteric readings. And I believe it's through, because if you look at, um, I think it's this for this ga, gone, then I don't know if you can see, these are very similar, but this one only has two of the little wedges and this one has three. So this one is gone and this one is ga with a little two because there's probably other ga variants. So this is ga in this sense, this whatever that means, right? But they're saying through these somehow there's like wordplay and just, you know, I guess they're similar sounding. I don't know if that's just what it's based on. That we get the reading to plant because you plant a garden. And yeah, I guess, I guess that makes sense, right? Because people, this and uh, we'll say that God's over here and Luz over here and what else? Oh, so then We get an other reading. Yeah, so this Lu Huninga is like he's they're saying this means man, but it also means whom or like person. And then Hoon can also be the preposition in and ga and isn't this the same as didn't I have like a ga oh yeah okay so these two to me they look di uh, no they are different right or did I just not draw that one correctly uh oh where's the part of a chapter where it talks about Gone, got to. No, there is supposed to be. Okay, that was my bad. I drew that wrong. They are very similar, but maybe it's just saying that there's a different reading of it. So this one they're saying means to plant. But then, in a later part of the chapter, this ga is put. So, yeah, that makes sense, because 
planting something and putting something is a similar type of verb, I guess. So we'll just uh, put Luhunga over here. Because you're planting and putting things in the garden and you're the, the god. But it's like, oh, well, how does like Eve get into this picture? So the text is going over, like repeating that we have like the stepland or open country or garden. And um, somewhere we get the word rib. But there's, it's not a separate logogram. I think it's just as a translation, one of the translations. Let me just see if I'm under, I'm looking at, like off screen, I'm looking at some of the footnotes and uh, illustrations in the book to double check. I have read this chapter, but when it gets to this part about the translations, it can just be, I mean, for me, complicated. If you're reading the book, it flows pretty well. But just to retain information about a language that you don't even know, I mean, at least for me, is kind of like a little bit of a struggle. It's like, did I memorize things in another language? So, um, but they get to the word rib somehow. I'm just trying to see if I missed something of like where, if there's a specific phrase. Um, oh, okay. So I see it was on the previous page. So they're saying that 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 Lagab uh, logogram had this meaning of the the step land it, in its way of being associated with an Akkadian word. So then that Akkadian word, which I think is like Bamatu or, or something like that, there's that relates to an Akkadian word that means rib or rib cage. So they're saying that this also through Lagab, looking the same as the shape, can get the meaning of this being a rib cage. And it, weirdly, that makes sense because if you think that it's Pegasus, it is a rib cage. So I'm going to like write that with question mark, but I mean, it kind of, I mean, even without understanding the other languages, it kind of is also a rib cage. Okay, so through that, they get to the whole thing of like Eve being made from the rib, right? And now I can turn the pages because I found where that was. And then they're saying that there's an alternate reading for Hun. And then that has like a kind of a, a word play with an Akkadian word meaning to name. And then there's some other Akkadian words. And then there's a word pronounced she, but it's not the English word she. It's like uh, an Akkadian word that just sounds like the word like she is just. So it's not saying English word she, it's saying it's pronounced like that, but it's an Akkadian word and, and what is the, the translation? Oh, oh, they're saying it because it means that part of like, you know, she will be called and they're naming her Eve. And I'm trying to see if we're, oh, so they're saying Eve is the English of the Hebrew Hawa. Is it Hawa? I know I I know what the, the name looks like. I don't know if the 
W is pronounced. Is it is it actually like English W or is it like actually like v, like Eve like Hava? I don't. I actually don't know that. Um. But where is the connection with the? I don't know. I'm sorry, but it's somewhere where there's all these like Akkadian and Sumerian words that kind of sound like each other. And then, yeah, so I'm just, I'm going to just skip ahead because at some point my interpretation has to be that part's too complicated. Here's the the things to focus on. Um, but somehow they get from hun to see to life, the meaning, to hava to ev. Um... Okay, so then, but they're in in there, in the book, there's not any separate, like, constellation that is Eve. I'll, I'll show somewhere in here, I think. They show, I'm going to find here. So, for example, and this is one of the Elizabeth Hardy uh, illustrations. They just make that man figure, not where Aries is. I don't know if it focuses better down here. They just add a woman and a man in that same constellation. But here's something that I question when I'm reading this. What about Andromeda? It's literally springing out of this rib cage. Because I don't know if you, the Greek, if you remember the Greek myth, the Andromeda constellation serves as both Medusa and Andromeda, because Perseus is with those figures in two different scenes. And Perseus slays Medusa, decapitates her, and from her blood springs. And I believe the blood comes in contact with the water when he's flying back to where Andromeda is, or flying to where Andromeda is. But Medusa's uh, blood from her head, which would be this star, but also the separate star in Perseus. Let me just, okay. Perseus is off this image, but I just want to show how it kind of, it kind of works for Perseus. Okay. So Perseus, here's my card for Perseus. So this on the Perseus constellation, which is kind of like off screen over here, this particular star, which is kind of like his near thigh, has the meaning or the name, the name of the star is Al Ghul, like Raj Al Ghul means a demon's head, right? This is the head of Medusa when Perseus is holding her. It you might see artwork and it will show Perseus sometimes facing away so that this is his back, but at his side, you can see Medusa's head facing, you know, out here. And it's represented by that star, Al Ghul, the, like the demon, the monster, right? But this star, Alpharaz, right? Yeah. And Andromeda and in Pegasus, it's Alpharaz today, which is the, the head of the, the chained woman. But it also, this particular star, had an alternate name of, I think it's pronounced Syra or Syra. And that translated to, and this I think is from combination of wikipedia searches and that book that is star names and i said I'll, I'll check on the the full title to give credit for that um so sira means like the the navel or the navel of the horse so the same star had the two names of the navel of the horse and the head of the chained woman and but when Perseus gets it, it transfers over into his constellation and he has it. And on the way, the, the, the monstrous blood makes Pegasus spring into being from the head. 
So I was just thinking, what if here it's the woman is springing from the rib cage the other way around? Like that's not what is in and the Sumerian myths, as far as I know. But if Eve is made from a rib, it, it's like maybe. So that's just my that's my addition. That's not. McHugh's not making that claim in, in the book, but I'm just like posing that as like, maybe if we're talking about this as a ribcage in his book, could it be that? And there's a man and a woman over here with a plow? But, okay, so let's just, let's continue on. Um, I'm just trying to look how much time it's been. It's, it's been a little bit. So let me see if I can, like, so I think we're about the part where they start to talk more about the, out the, oh yeah, like the geography of the garden. Like the, like if you know the story, there's this whole part with like rivers that flow um, out of the land. So they use the gob again because it looks like the field, the Pegasus Square, and then... They're saying that mul just means star. I know that one. And, oh, E and Q. So they're saying that if we remember the logogram was gone, which had the reading of Iku. But I'm guessing that there's also an E and a Ku separate logograms. And there's also a Mul logogram. So in a sense, if we're talking about this constellation, it's the the star or stars that makes the reading EQ that I can I can un, kind of understand the wordplay there, but then these logograms have other readings, so E can be like the verb of like going or flowing or going out of, that's what it's saying in in this chapter, but it also can mean river like the the noun you know a river. And mole, which is a star, they're saying through some wordplay, can mean water. And ku can mean from. So there's like some prepositions and stuff that I personally don't think is necessary. I think, just this is just me, if you get the wordplay to tell you the major concepts and like objects and actions involved you don't need to explain that they got wordplay that even led them to like conjunctions or prepositions or something but pre to present what uh john McHugh is saying in this book he is including stuff like that he's saying like i even can I mean, he's not literally saying, I'm like doing the imaginary voice. He doesn't talk like that, but he he's basically saying no, even to the point of like prepositions, they're literally getting the scripture from all this like wordplay. I don't know if I'm convinced of that, but that that seems to be what the book is presenting. And I can I can see it in some of these. I mean, some some of them make more. Let me just say, some of them makes more sense to me as a reader than others. I mean, I still think this is like super interesting. It's just a lot if you don't already know some of the ancient languages. But um, yeah, so we get to this concept of rivers. We already have the shoulder rivers, and. Um, He's saying that the word play from, you know, the name and the, the meaning of this being the field and it looking like this, the gob and 
um, being like, you know, the constellation of the field, that now it has this added association of water and rivers that are flowing out. And there's just some illustrations. Okay, so now we get to the point in the chapter where John McHugh brings in Pisces into the interpretation. So up until now, it was focused on um, Aquarius playing the god figure, the the man, or uh, in this story would be Adam, um, the plow, having this like uh, additional wordplay of like planting and putting, the you know the garden, also a rib cage. And now we're getting to Pisces being these rivers. Now let me just quickly reach for something here because um, I believe it is here. So I mentioned this in another stream. This is just a printout of information that I got online, but it's from... If you search for Babylonian star catalogs or the Mul Apin, you can find a similar chart to this. And it's here. This column is in English, the name of the con like the translation of the name of the constellation. This is this column would be the Sumerian name of a constellation that was known to them. Like so in their culture. These are the names of Sumerian constellations. Then the next column is the Akkadian reading, how the Akkadians would say the name. And then the English translation of what that means. And then this last column is what modern constellation corresponds to that. So in some cases, it's one for one. For example, if it says the farm worker is Aries, but here Pisces appears he on two of them because um, there's a constellation that in Sumerian is known as Mul Kun Mesh or alternately Mul Zib Zib or Zib. May. And the Akkadian is like Zibatu or and then my my paper's a little something and it says Sinu Nutu. I might be mispronouncing that. But anyway, in English it means the tales. So they had and this is, you know, just my rough like sketch, but there's other stars in here. And they imagined the stars of Pisces as the tails of a swallow. But in all, remember how I said there was two readings here? So it was the tails, meaning the swallows, because they imagined a swallow type bird being somewhere in this area also as a constellation. Or it could be the two rivers. Tigris, uh, how did they, Tigris and Euphrates. And that is what uh, McHugh is saying. He's saying that this represented Tigris, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And then that would mean what's between the rivers. This would kind of be Mesopotamia. Like he doesn't, I don't think he says that spells it out, but that's my interpretation or what the implication would be is like, if we're saying that this represents the two rivers, the land between the two rivers is Mesopotamia. So all of this is taking place in Mesopotamia, which is the field, the garden, and the ribcage. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I mean, it has fish in it, and rivers have fish in it. So then they bring in some other constellation. I'm not constellation. I'm sorry, logograms. So this one says, 
Ashgan. And Ash is like, like it's saying here is just the, the word for or the logogram for the number one is or one of something at least. So and it look at look what it looks like. It looks like it could be one of something. Right. So this is just one. And then we're reusing this same. It still me has that meaning of field. So Gans red as Iku still means field. But if we put that that ash in there then you get additional um so i'll just put that up here i don't know if you can see that but it's so oh, no, it's above sorry um but now maybe this other stuff's not in view i don't know sorry I'll just... um and then they're saying this logogram I don't know if it's pronounced U. It looks like the letter U, so I'm not sure how how to pronounce the name of it. But it looks like it's saying it can have a meaning of oh, literally the word of. Okay. And then there introducing that lagab which we already used several times can have a reading of east huh oh it's an alternate reading okay lagab has an alternate reading of east or a word, nigin, I guess. I don't know how to pronounce that. That would have the meaning east. But this is like that whole thing of like uh, in the, you know, in the east of Eden or like, you know. They're getting to how that also is tied in. And... Uh, this part I thought was interesting. So if if you've read the Eden story in Genesis, it talks about um, this number of rivers. There's four rivers, and the other there was the Tigers and Frates, But then it's saying that there's also the way they appear in um, in Genesis is one is Gihon, Gihon, like it's a hard H, I believe, like Gihon, and the other is Pichon, Pichon, and, but the author is saying that the word Pichon, not with the sh, uh, the, the, is the, is a type of basket. So, it looks like the words Pison and Gihon, Gihon, I don't know how to, are both a basket. And that is interesting because they're saying that through this different wordplay that they're baskets but also rivers. I'm just going to show one of the, the illustrations. I'm sorry, I'm looking here. Hold this better. Okay, so, and I, this isn't, uh, yeah, this is Elizabeth Hardy again. But they're showing like, here's a river, here's a river. And there's these baskets. And the baskets are baskets and rivers. It's like saying it, like it equals both. Like the same word could be like basket or river. So are there four rivers in Eden or some of those baskets? But what I think is interesting is that they're tying this all in with like uh, Pisces and the Pegasus Square. And Pisces is also the Jesus era constellation, right? Like the age of Pisces. 
and it's like the bread and the fish. And the if there's really like a concept of wordplay that gives you baskets here, in the bread and the the multiplying bread and fish miracle, don't they use baskets? And that's not even here in this story. That's just like the implication of there being baskets near Pisces is like. So that's something to look into, like how obvious is that wordplay? Like, would anyone else be able to find the baskets? I don't know. I do know that um, I'm just going to look at my Pegasus flashcard for a second to see if I have the spelling of it. But yeah, there's these two little little stars in here and I think one is named Psalm and the other one it might be Al Karab I wrote it so tiny it's hard for me to read my own handwriting but I believe the those translate to mean one is like the 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 bucket and one is the rope as if the square is a well, and the bucket and the rope are going into the well to fetch out water. Which, uh, is it in this chapter? No, I don't think it's in this chapter. I think there is a later chapter in this book where that also, the idea of water in this constellation also becomes relevant again. So there's, astrotheology has like so much just weird... Like, this thing, you know, like I was saying in the, uh, the previous, um, the previous stream, it's just, like, people get, like, we found the, the esoteric thing that nobody else has discovered. Yeah, so I guess they, I guess we can explain, yeah, there's two rivers, and then there's these two baskets, which are also rivers, and then that equals four, and then it's saying, um... Oh, so that's where, where's that one that I had that was here? So then this, this one has an other, because we said it, it pre, on the previous page, it said this can have a meaning of, of, but it also here on, on this part is saying it can mean things like um, all or cush, which is also a proper name that appears in Genesis. And then we can, from Lagab, it looks like get a reading of Kur, which means land. I thought, wait, did I have? No, I have Ku, not Kur, sorry. Um, so, like, because in, in Genesis, the way they phrase it is that these rivers are circling around or winding around certain parts of uh, the geography but what I think is interesting is that circling around there's a circlet in Pisces this asterism is the circlet in the constellation of Pisces and we're getting a little bit toward the end of this chapter so I'll probably just cover this chapter and not try and go farther because it's already been a while but um then through, I guess, a pun with Iku, which is the reading of Gan, and a similar sounding word or Igu, that we get this word. Uh, oh, this is what they were talking about before. Igu is how they get she, the meaning life. And then through... Lagab gets through some wordplay gets the meaning of evil fruit or fruit tree. It's like when you read when you read the actual text in this book, it'll be like this Akkadian word and this other Akkadian word. But for me to present that is like there's not like a visual thing to show you. It's just like a bunch of Akkadian words that I'm probably not going to pronounce correctly. But if you read it, it's like you can see, oh, it gets there through these other terms. 
but basically the trees uh, being in the midst of the garden. Um, like the gob uh, through some wordplay being associated with fruit, as was said. Um, that they're then have to gonna like work or toil or till this out that the plow. They're going to have to plow till work the soil. And then the part where they get sent out of the garden. Okay, so I think what they're saying here is the, the Lou, which is man. So maybe Lou is the reading, not the name of the logogram. But there's a similar sounding word, Lou, or Lo, I don't, but anyway, there's a pun where a similar looking and sounding word, one is man and the other is bull. So that's, that's interesting. Is it a, a male human or a male cattle? Um... But from the idea of the bull, they get to these uh, winged bull protectors. That And you maybe in Babylonian culture, you've seen images of such things. I think that's what they're getting at. That through the various wordplay and association, you get to uh, the bull figure and then... You get to, I think, some Akkadian, or maybe, I think it's Sumerian, what is it saying? But I, they're saying something, you get to gay, and then rubu, which sounds like the Hebrew word kerub, cherubim being the plural. So I think they get to the cherubim. If you want to say it in English, through this bull figure. And I'm not sure where they're getting the sword. I'm looking. Yeah, they're saying Lagab again somehow gets to the reading of gear, which means sword. But it also has a reading of... Nigin, which means east. Um, and this is kind of the end of the chapter. I'm trying to turn the page and see. I'm just, I'm going to read a, a short excerpt from uh, Celestial Code of Scripture. This I mean, the same book we've been talking about. I'm just showing it again, John McHugh. So this is from Chapter 7, The Astral Garden of Eden. And this is what the author is saying. Uh, well, McHugh, the author. I was astounded by the sheer simplicity of the data I had encountered. The evidence implied that the authors of the Garden of Eden story were privy to the code that I had been imparted. Oh, sorry. Were privy to the code that had been imparted to Jewish magi during their two centuries of enslavement by the Assyrians and Babylonians. During the Assyrian Babylonian subjugations, Jewish scholar magicians were indoctrinated with the tenet that the starry sky contained heavenly writing, that 
imparted its wisdom through constellation writing, wordplay, sacred puns that Jewish magicians such as Daniel and Ezekiel then translated into Hebrew as their creation myth. So that kind of sums up the author's premise of how the the wordplay gets um you know like just how how we said how how the all this esoteric readings of logograms and uh Akkadian words um with like I guess uh Hebrew and and uh other languages um you know, reveals like word for word the story of the Garden of Eden. So I'm I'm gonna wrap up the stream. Um, but I guess I'll just go over. The idea is that we have a god figure played by Aquarius. I am saying that probably this is how Aya or Enki would be seen with uh, Aquarius and part of Pegasus because the goat uh, is actually here. Because remember, I said I, I messed up the, the scale of it. So th he has the goat at, it, on, at this foot and the eagle above this hand. This is the Pegasus square is representing... Well, it's Pegasus ribcage, but a ribcage, but also some kind of field or garden or country. But if we do think that the swallow's tails are a constellation of Pisces represented the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, yeah, then this would be Mesopotamia and all the things are happening here. Um, Aries is the, the hired worker with his plow, maybe... We're saying here this represented Adam. And then Eve through various wordplay gets created. But then I'm adding in, what if Eve sprouted from the rib cage and Andromeda is Eve? I I know of other um, other people's interpretations where a different constellation is said to be Eve. And I think they have some good points as well. So maybe in the future we'll get to that. But I'm saying if this is the setting we're going with, why wouldn't this Andromeda figure be Eve? I should add that there is a Sumerian constellation in that they don't call it Andromeda. It is... um. Okay, so our constellation of Andromeda and parts of Pisces, so this whole area without this top part of Pisces, this whole area here, is Mul Anunitum, or it has a second meaning of Mul Lulim. Lulim. And that first one means the God, the, sorry, excuse me, the goddess Anunitu, so that's like a proper name. Or the Mululim is the constellation of the stag. So in these stars where we have Andromeda, there was a goddess figure here somehow. I don't know if it was like, here's the head and here's the feet, as we would see it with Andromeda. But somewhere they were imagining a goddess figure or there was a stag. I might look into this because I'm not sure if this end here is the antlers or like this end here is the antlers. I mean, it could be like if this is like part of the, the leg here. I mean, but somewhere... Anyway, I'm saying that if there's a woman who can turn into a, sna a stag or a goddess, it could be Andromeda in this part of the sky. So that's something to think about. Um, so the, the next chapter up is chapter 8 of the Celestial Code of Scripture. And that covers Noah's Flood. So I'll 
take uh, probably another day or so to check my flashcards and uh, read that over again. But um, thanks uh, for listening and watching this stream. Thank you.